if you have the passion. Go ahead. Because at the end of the day, once you're done, <laughs> it's very rewarding. The only problem is that you never stop learning. Because you, you know, you are, you are in a dynamic society. So immediately you talk about school, you finish the internship, you have to think about what next. So have the passion, but it is rewarding. Hang in there, do it. As for business, come upon a round of Don't do that. If you have a, hey, do not do it. Because business brings a lot of dynamics. Eh? My name is Moses Obonyo. I'm also known as Teddy Moses. But uh, most people know me by the name Ted. I am a um, medical imaging specialist. And uh, since training, I've been practicing for roughly 12 years. Yes. <laughs> of course, the journey takes different paths. So after the basic training, you must go for another training, and another training, and another training. Yes. There is a saying that the higher you go, the cooler it becomes. My experience is, if you're good in school, from the fundamental level, up to the time you get to high school, if you're able to get from primary school and get a very good high school in, let's say, a national school, it's a plus for you. Because there's a transition. The fees you're paying in primary school, if you're, for example, in a private school, significantly reduces when you go to a national school. Likewise, if you work very hard and you have very good grades, you get the opportunity to go to university and also pay very little for your course. So if you use the normal government route, whereby you're taken to school on a government-sponsored program, it is quite affordable. But if you do it on a private uh, basis, it's quite expensive. Mm -hmm. Like if you're going to study medicine as it is, you will need to pay, most universities right now have prices of between 630 to 640,000 per semester. Per semester? Per year. Yes. 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 So you can imagine how much money that is for six years. Yeah. So if you use the um, self-sponsored method, it's expensive. And if you use the normal program whereby you get good grades and go to school and you're able to be given a very good program by the government, it's very cheap. Yeah, it is quite affordable. Uh, and that is the medicine now. But if you are to, like in my profession, you can do it uh, in two ways. You can do it um, just specifically for medical imaging, whereby you just operate medical imaging equipment, and that just becomes your profession. But you can also do it as a subspecialty after you've done medicine. So you become a medical doctor first, and then you do a radiology, so that now you're able to operate and also report. So if you go to college to just study medical imaging, it's again cheaper. Because per year you spend close to 67, 68,000 shillings in a year, government sponsored. But if you go as a private person, again it becomes a bit costly. Yes. So you're not done your No, I've not done both. Oh, I started well. out as a medical imaging professional, and then my subsequent trainings have given me various capabilities within the field. But professionally, I started out as a medical imaging professional. Yeah. Oof, confusing. <laughs> really, really confusing. And you know, you go to school, you go to school having these expectations or these expectations, and then you get expectations that are over the roof, or you get expectations that are less. My first day in college was very confusing because I'm one of those persons who I've not grown up in town. I've been in charge, yeah? So, and then I went to Kenyatta National Hospital where we're doing our, um, uh, where we did our attachments later and clinical practice. And I was like, so this hospital actually exists. It was disbelief and it was quite confusing because now you've been used to a certain set of knowledge, a certain set of thoughts. And all of a sudden there is this serious problem that you have to undertake and they're going to actually take care of patients. 
Mm. So look at the medical imaging equipment and I'm like, wow, this is what we're going to do correct, you know? Mm. Yeah, so it was a bit surprising and quite confusing in my first place. Mm. Yeah, but rewarding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yes. <laughs> because I was very passionate about this. I really, really wanted to see the inside of a patient without cutting them out. So, because I had the passion, I spent a lot of time within the practical areas. So it took me, I think, not more than six months to understand the workings of this equipment. Not to operate them, but just to understand the principle by which they operate. So within six months, I was well aware how this is how an ultrasound machine works. This is how an X-ray machine works, this is how CT scan works, this is how an RI works, and so on and so forth. And then within the year, within my first year, I was at least able to do basic X-ray work and uh, specialized X-ray work under guidance. I was also able to do CT scans. <clears throat> I've never been interested in MRI. It's never been my interest, so I did spend time there. But um, CT, X-ray, exempting ultrasound, I was able to master them within the first year. Yes. Hospitals, as they are constituted, they have their own principles, they have got, they, they've got their own values, they have their own basis to which they operate. Most of these things are decided by policy holders, who are the managers of the hospital, and so on and so forth. Structurally, we as professionals will not have a very big say. You, I'm sure, seen strikes. People strike and say, you know, doctors or nurses or clinical officers or whatever kind of they are striking and they say, we want this, we want this, and we want this. At the end of the day, they will tell them, okay, fine, we'll give you one. But how many places, if you follow up, have actually been given? So the policy maker will make those decisions for various hospitals. After I finished training, personally, I've not worked for a public institution. After I finished training, I think I was blessed or something. I was very lucky. In fact, I got my first job when I was still in college. I had like six months to go. And somebody already identified me and the talent I had and they already trusted me in their job. So it has been a private institution all along. So having been in the private sector, I noticed that majority of the time, people are more concerned about what the patient brings to them in terms of income. Okay? So if you visited, for example, different hospitals that are good hospitals and you're told, you know, get the best treatment and so on, if you visit these hospitals, you realize so many disparities. For example, where patients wait, where patients look and remove themselves, yeah? where patients eat and so on. There is huge disparity. So most people employ a minimalistic approach because they want you to bring the money, they give you the minimal service you can get the best way they can, so that you get your answers, and then you go so that they are able to keep as much as possible. That is in the private center. So I was like, most people will need an X-ray. Most people will need an ultrasound. Most people will need a CT scan, yeah? But do they have to go and get this CT scan in an environment that is crowded? Do they have to get this CT scan in an environment that if they go to the toilet, there is a smell, it's not very clean, it's not very well kept? Do they have to get the service at a place whereby they can't sit and wait in an ample, you know, environment? And do they have to pay so high so that they can be able to get this thing? Because most people who have been able to do it, they sort of give you the opportunity to get the service in terms of ambience and everything else that you pay for. And we know some of the institutions that are very expensive, but you get that ambience. So what I told myself was, having worked in the private sector, I felt like one thing the private sector does not do is they don't give the patient value for their money. You might get a very good report, a very good work done for you, but now most patients don't look at this image. They even don't look at this report. What they remember is the receptionist who attended to them. What they remember is where they sat. What they remember is where they went to the toilet. What they remember is the environment of the place. That is what most patients remember. So I decided to open this up because in my mind I thought that I want to give the patient a good solution that is not expensive, but worth their time and their money. That is how I ended up. It was a disparity in the matter of the person.
we do we offer x-ray services we offer opg services opg is x-ray of the teeth i would say yeah it gives you one film of all the teeth including the jaw and the maxilla we also offer ct scan services and we offer ultrasound services and we also offer echocardiography services echocardiography is basically scanning the heart to know if there's a problem on it for various reasons yeah we are not cheap we are not expensive i like to say we are affordable ultrasound services range between 3500 and 5500 depending on which region you do the that and sometimes you get a situation whereby the doctor wants you to look at more than two regions for example the doctor wants you to check an abdomen and also check your pelvis and your legs those are two totally different examinations that require different preparation CT scans will range between 7,000 and 10,000. 7,000 being a um, CT scan for the head. And then between 8,000 and 10,000, it covers now the chest and the abdomen and the pelvis and so on. So our, uh, our price range for ultrasound is basically between 2,500 and 5,500. CT scan the range is 7,000 to 10,000. Echocardiography is 6,000. Insurance. And then X-ray services, they range between 1,400 and 4,500, depending on which examination the doctor is concerned. Yes. Medical procedures, most of the time, have what is required, uh, what is called a consent. If you walk in as a patient, I will not just get you and then start examining you. I will get you first, sit you down, then discuss with you. And then depending on the procedure that you want, I'll explain to you everything that you need to know about that procedure so that at the end of the day, you make the decision. Like you have asked, and rightly said, there are people who are vulnerable for various reasons. And we have had people who come in for examinations, but they end up choosing not to do the examination. Not because we are bad people, but because we give you all the information that you need to know so that by the time you're saying, fine, let's go ahead and do this examination you are well aware you understand everything for example if you came in to do a CT scan of the abdomen for example i will explain to you the procedure including things like you will need to take some medication before the procedure is done during the procedure i will inject you with some medication and i will go ahead and explain to you that this medication will make you feel certain things nausea sometimes a little, a little bit of heat rash sometimes you can actually vomit yes and i'll explain to you all those things and i'll also tell you that this contrast might have the capability of injuring your kidneys so before you even do this examination i will require that you do a lab test to tell us that the kidneys are working well before i can be able to put you there and do this examination for you and if you agree that this is what you want to do, I will give you a form, which explains and puts everything in details. Everything that I have told you, the risks, the benefits, and so on, which is tabulated in that uh, concept, and then you sign, and I also sign, or whoever is operating the equipment that time, sign. So that you are well aware, you are well educated, and you make an informed decision as you go there. Then after the procedure has been done, like here, we have a launch on this um, just next. So. After that procedure has been done, and you want to sit down and rest and so on, and so forth, I invite you there, you sit with a cup of coffee and just relax there and wait for your results to be ready. Whilst they are ready, you come. Now, but yes, if you come in, not just the vulnerable people, even the people who come in, uh, me and I still have to do the same procedure. This x ray, you are doing for this part, for this reason, these are the risks, and this is what you need to know, and so on. Medical insurances we do, however they are challenging. For a standalone imaging facility, you need a lot of accreditation, you need a lot of licensure. Because of the procedures which are required in terms of 
registration inline session and so on, most insurances are usually very, very critical before they give you the opportunity to see their patient. Most insurances actually want you to have any sort of contract. Now, what NHIF have done, initially, people in the private sector would have used that. They would set up non existent hospital and lie, they have over 100 beds. Sometimes they would treat wounds on the finger and indicate that they have amputated. So they would miss you. So, because of the fraud that was going on, NHIF decided to, cons- to cancel most of the, uh, the contracts for the people who are providing medical care. And in hindsight, what the government did was they tried to upgrade or sort of equip their hospital so that whatever the patient needs is available in the hospital. And so NHIF became so, so strict such that if there is a service that the patient wants within a certain jurisdiction and it is available in a government hospital, go to the government hospital. So it takes a patient an examination that cannot be done in a hospital, the government hospital, for them to come to the center. So you have to demonstrate that we are giving you a service that is not offered at your hospital, or we are giving you a service that cannot uh, complement whatever that you are doing at your hospital. So this institution, as it is, is um, an affiliate of another institution that is in Rwanda. Rwanda will be here in Kenya just after this week. The institution in Luanda has around 14 uh, insurance companies. Uh, the most prominent ones and even the smaller ones. Yeah? And because of that now, we have gotten to the stage whereby we are now asking the insurance providers, can we not charge? We are the same people, and now we have this service in Makuru and the patients can utilize this uh, service. So, can we not charge? Well, most of them have given us good feedback, but they have to come now and Assess the environment, assess the facility, and later on, give their condition. There are some that do not have a problem. They are just say sour. So, we accept some insurances, but we are still in the process of streamlining the process. Because now, when you have a franchise insurance, people, somebody accepts and says, okay, it's grants, okay, we have grants here, we have grants there, and let them make their service. There's a lot of other issues that happen in between there, sorting out the accounts and how the application is going to be paid and so on and so forth. So a CT scan can be done here. Then they send the money, the insurance sends the money. But now you have to sit down and ask, you person, you know, your mind. Is it for the patient that you saw in Akuru? Is it for the patient that you saw in Kisumu? Okay? So there's a whole host of other issues that are going on. And we are trying to spin that. And once we are, we have streamlined the 14 insurances automatically coming back. Apart from the ones that we want us to sort of uh, do the application. As for training and then opening the center, one thing that you must know is that the biology business is very expensive. Very, very expensive. If you are to give the patient a good service, that is going, they are going to be happy and it can, it can be dependable, it can be reliable. You have to have good equipment and good equipment. For example, a good ultrasound machine will cost you not more than 180 million shares. A good CT scan machine will cost you not more than 15 million shares. And that is apart from the money that you will use to set up the place. For example, the CT scan room. Because the CT scan machine beats off radiation, and radiation is not safe for human beings, we want to minimize as much as possible the amount of radiation that we get. We have to prepare the room in such a manner that it is leak proof. Okay? So there are considerations for the wall, there are considerations for the door, there are considerations for the window, there are considerations for the space itself in terms of size, and so on and so forth. So for you to be able to get to get the, the the right tools together in terms of equipment and space, it's quite expensive, but it's also very reliable. So if you have the money up a school and you want to open your center, it's okay. You simply need to now follow the procedure of first of all, if you're setting up a full regulatory center, you have to create floor plans with your architect, then send them to the people who do regulation. Kenya nuclear regulatory authority. They will look at the drawings and then advise. Change this, add this, this is okay, and so on and so forth. Then after that, they'll allow you to build. So after you build, you're addition proof now. 
by putting things like lead metal and lead glass. Then after that, you call these people. After you've installed the equipment, you call them again. Then they come and look at the equipment, then they do a series of tests. After they have done tests and they are happy that you are not looking at radiation and it is safe to operate the equipment, they now give you the license to continue the operation. But also as a professional, you have to go to the bodies that will be to work. If you are a medical doctor who is doing radiology, you have to go to the NPDC, go to their, um, their licensure to operate as a professional. If you're doing medical imaging as a standalone, you have to go to Society of Radiography in Kenya and get a license to be able to operate. Then finally, the institution itself must be accredited by the body that oversees healthcare within the country, which is KNPDC. So KNPDC must send their assessor, they look at the environment. Do you have care limit? Does it have running water? Do you have space for patients to wait? Is your space able to handle the mother? It's in case of an emergency, what happens? Are you able to handle? Do you have a professional mind? How is your location? So many things we ask with a checklist that is almost, I think, 24 pages. So once they, ha- they are happy and they have accepted that you are doing something good, they will now give you a license for the premise. So remember, there's a license for you as a professional, then the premise also will have its own license. And then the equipment that you have, you also have a license. Okay? And then, of course, the local government. I've been to uh, six countries. I've been to the Netherlands. I've been to Austria. The locally, I've been to San Sudan. I've been to the Democratic Republic of Congo. I've been to Ethiopia. Those are five, yeah? Yes. Those opportunities are there. When I went to the Netherlands and Austria, it was an opportunity to learn as I work. For South Sudan, DRC, and Ethiopia, it is basically just work. Those opportunities are there, and what normally makes most people go and settle there is the opportunity that this chance is going to be. Because when you go to such countries that are far off, better developed than here, of course you want to stay there and have the best training, you want to continue in schooling, then also have children who can be able to enjoy certain things in life and certain opportunity. But basically it's normally because of the package. The package is very, very attractive. Because you get people who you know you get a visa to go and people your whole family can imagine. So I got the opportunity myself. But for me I just wanted to train when I to come back and they are training or they're thinking about going to train. I've always told people you must be passionate. I normally pity, not pity, but I feel sorry for the people who go through the medical course itself. It's quite strange. Very, very strange. It puts strain on everything that you have. You as a person, finances, your time, and so on. It's very, very strange. So it only takes passion for you to go through that thing. If you're not passionate, you will not survive. And then the thing you see on a daily basis, some of them are hard to You get frustration whether you have done a human examination for it. Somebody who just walked in like this, and you say, like, well, I don't need you, I'm not too much planning, I want to see how, if I'm okay or not. Then you go and check and find things that are not consumable to that person. And you can almost tell the path this person is going to take for the next six months or months. When um, you get a surgical diagnosis in a local theater and a computer. Or sometimes you get a computer and you get a camera. So they leave you alone when you come back six months down the line and you become your doctor. So it takes time for most clinicians and doctors to understand your product and what you're giving to them and to be good. You must demonstrate to them that you're doing the right thing and you can accept or consume it every day for them. But now there are other than than an example of the analysis on the good one can be taken. You have one point eight million that is lying around and you want to use in the business, yeah? So it means most people will go for loans and, and, and so on and so forth to be able to put up the facilities and so on. And that comes with its own pressure. Wow. 
Yes. My name is Ted, and this is Imagine Business. Yeah.